On this episode, I'm speaking with the host of another sleep podcast. Dr. Jay Korsandi is a health, wellness, anti-aging and longevity advocate with over 20 years of patient care success as a dentist, entrepreneur and airway advocate. Combining cutting-edge science and his passion for biohacking, he was has developed numerous strategies to help people feel better, sleep better and live healthier lives. He's also the creator and a producer of a very popular health, wellness and sleep podcast called Best Night Ever. Jet lag is a major trigger for disrupted sleep patterns. It can impact sleep quality long term. What are the typical culprits of jet lag and does the direction you fly matter? How can you actually prevent the exposure of EMF on flights and reduce that impact of jet lag? What are some of the hacks that you can use to protect yourself? Here's a look at the sleep biohackers, biohacks for anyone who wants to manage a life of frequent flying through different time zones and consistent jet lag using food, supplements and superfoods as well. It's episode number 54 and do remember that even if you do not struggle with jet lag, many of the protocols mentioned on this episode can be very useful to implement if you do struggle with shift work, unusual circadian rhythm or if you just plain struggle to restore a more balanced biorhythm. Stay tuned for our anniversary episode next week where there's some wonderful surprises for you which you can look forward to in the coming year with the Sleep Whisperer podcast and in the last three months We're growing at a steady rate of 50% growth with each subsequent month. Do leave us some ratings and review on Apple Podcasts so that it can reach a wider audience and help this wonderful information reach more and more people who are struggling with poor sleep. Now take a listen to my episode with Dr. Jay Korsandi. Welcome to the Sleep Whisperer Podcast. I'm your host, Deepa. Join me and my many expert guests and medical professionals from the cutting-edge science of functional medicine of the West and ancient wisdom of the East. Learn all about how to discover your root causes of poor sleep and understand the proper tools and techniques to end your confusion and begin getting a good night's sleep. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey with the Sleep Whisperer Podcast. Dr. J, it's a pleasure to have the sleep biohacker on the Sleep Whisperer podcast and we are talking about jet lag today, jet lag and sleep restoration. I know that you are you have so much to contribute in this area, so I'm really excited to get started and uh, I did an episode a while ago on time zones, but I don't think anyone really went into the in the intricacies of jet lag, how it impacts sleep and also what are the little ways of really biohacking your um, uh, jet. If you have this lifestyle where you have frequent flying, so you're the best person to talk about this. Um, so I know that you have a, a, an amazing sleep podcast called uh, this uh, sleep biohacking pod- uh, best night ever best night ever yes um, so I would like to know how did you actually end up being called the sleep biohacker so it's an interesting question and thank you for having me uh, I was uh, you know, my focuses have changed over the years in my career in, in treating patients. And over the last six years, I've been focused 100% on sleep uh, and snoring and sleep apnea and helping patients sleep better at night. And part of my own health challenges, uh, I had to figure out ways to get myself better because the traditional medicine was not helping me the way I needed to be helped. That's when I learned about uh, this whole world of biohacking. 
And then that I took the combination of biohacking and sleep and made a sleep biohacker just so I can share the knowledge that I've learned and hopefully help other people. Excellent. So but when was the age where you actually struggled with sleep and what was the reasons for you to reach that state where you had challenges with your sleep? It's, you know, it's an interesting question because the majority of my patients, including myself, uh, being male, uh, the age that seems to be the most poignant is the 40. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when men hit 40, they, they, there's a shift in the biology and the hormones, uh, testosterone levels, and generally health starts to decline a bit more. We're not young anymore. We're not in our 20s or 30s. So that's when I started to notice a little bit of the effects of aging and when I started to really become more proactive against getting sick. That's interesting because I would actually, people would think that sleep issues would affect somebody more when they've just started working maybe in the early 30s and suddenly they have no concept of time and schedules. Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, most people would think it were that way. So that is a relevant yeah. point that the hormones say, is it that there's the dip in testosterone in men yes. at that age and that... Yes. Hmm, yeah, there's a dip in testosterone. You know, I think sleep issues could start earlier. Uh, the issue is, is that when we're younger, we tend to notice less of the problems. So maybe it doesn't bother us as much. But as we get older, our bodies can't handle the stress as it used to. So it becomes more important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, there is a world that jet lag is such a big part of. But of course, right now in the situation that we are in, that's probably improved for a lot of people. But I would still think that people who are working even virtually across different time zones, it is it can be impactful. But I would like to stay with jet lag today. Um, and this is a big reason because I see people who are in uh, three different time zones in a week at times and then they just don't know how to settle back and I know you have a lot to share in terms of the direction that you fly and shortening of the circadian rhythm um, so let's just talk about how would you actually define jet lag because people tend to think that it's just um, when they've traveled a little bit and come back and for a few hours they struggle. But obviously, if this is a way their life is, cumulatively, it can have disastrous long-term effects. So what are the ways that you would define jet lag? So the way I would define jet lag is, you know, the common conception of jet lag is, you know, we get on a flight, we go somewhere, we don't feel good. Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes, uh, both in our biological processes, our circadian clock, uh, inflammation. So it's a combination of a number of different factors that come together, uh, but it doesn't have to be like that. We can, quote unquote, hack our, 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 our bodies to perform better and minimize the effects of this jet lag. Yeah, so you did mention inflammation. I would like you to talk a little bit more in detail about some of these triggers of what's going, because obviously some people are impacted more severely than others. So there is something going on within themselves. So what are all the different triggers that you would list and how does that, so how would inflammation actually make somebody more prone to the um, troubling effects of jet lag versus someone else. So yeah, just to yeah be a little more clear about jet lag, it, there's two main culprits for jet lag. One is circadian shift, which is a shift in our clocks, and the other is acute inflammation. So to get to the inflammation, when we fly, uh, flying is a very inflammatory process on, on many different levels. One of the levels is going to be psychological because we are in a stressed state. Uh, right now, obviously, the travel world is a little bit different during this pandemic. Uh, people aren't flying as much. But generally, when you go to an airport, there's a lot of stress with a lot of people, a lot of security, taking off shoes and bags and, and getting on and getting in queues. And 
that's one level of stress. Uh, now you can add on the level of, you know, possible points of infection and, and uh, disease and things like that, which some people are sensitive to. Uh, the other big level of in inflammation is going to be uh, radiation, ionizing radiation exposure. This is going to be going through those x-ray scanners. It's going to be sitting in an airplane at 30,000 feet in the sky uh, where the atmosphere is thinner and there's more radiation coming, penetrating through the body. And when you factor in all of these different things, and then also uh, diet choices, you know, whether it's at the airport eating uh, food that's not the healthiest choice, or if you're being served some food that's on a flight and uh, it's not the most nutritious, these all increase the level of inflammation in our bodies. Now, some people are unhealthy, they live you know, less optimal lifestyles, they're going to be more impacted by this inflammation because their body is not set up for it. Uh, while others who are more, uh, let's say, health conscious might be able to reduce the effects of the inflammation. We can talk about ways that we can do that as well. Yes, absolutely. So I did notice that you speak a little bit about the flying direction. And I know that somebody else mentioned to me that when I fly this direction, I'm fine. When I fly the other direction, I'm not so fine. Uh, so can we talk a little bit about that? What does, how does direction matter and um, why? Yes, of course. If, you know, for me and probably for a lot of people who listen, they always have a, a sense or a feeling when they're traveling that the flight or the experience was different, either going there or coming back. Mm. Depends on where you're going and what direction. Now, specifically, the, the, the situation that's going to be more difficult to deal with is flying east. Uh, and the reason for that is when you fly east, you shorten your circadian clock. Uh, which is our internal clock. Our clocks run about 24 and a half hours a day. So they're used to a little bit longer days, but uh, they have a much more difficult time uh, when it's shortened or shorter days. Mm -hmm. So I'm here in Los Angeles. If I'm flying to, let's say London, it's going to be a, a harder time for me, harder on my body than if I'm flying from London back to Los Angeles, uh, just because uh, the way the circadian rhythm works. So, so that's going to be the first thing to know is what direction you're going in, in the beginning of the, your trip and then on the way back. So you know which one that you need to pay more attention to. Mm. So, I mean, this is not something I think a lot of people are not quite aware of. Uh, so they would know Los Angeles to London. They wouldn't really be, I don't think everyone would be aware that, okay, now I'm flying East. So that itself is one thing for people to actually look at the direction that they're flying and uh, start to make a sense of it. And of course, I think that would help a lot if they were frequent flyers, because if they had certain destinations, then they're quite aware of uh, these factors. And I would like to talk a little bit about what uh, does the time that you fly, for example, you know that your sh uh, circadian clock is going to be shortened when you fly east. So is there a way that you can pick flight times to make that easier on yourself? Yeah, you can uh, to some extent if the flight is available. But if you are able to stay awake. If you can put an early morning flight and still arrive and it's not nighttime, I think you're better off mm -hmm. uh, just because your body's still going to be used to a normal day schedule. Uh, sometimes these red eye flights are, are difficult for people The overnight flights. Uh, it's also difficult to sleep on a plane, you know, <laughs> unless you have maybe first class and you have a lot of room. Yeah. If you're flying e economy, uh, it's going to be difficult to give your body the, the chance to rest. And I heard somebody tell me that I make sure that I don't fall asleep when I take a flight to the US from India because I struggle. So when I reach there, I go and I hit the, hit my room, my bed, and I take a good long nap. So um, I know that you said it's hard to sleep on a flight if it's not first class, which is a very valid point. But do you think that it's probably easier if somebody tries to stay awake? I, I would say if, you, if it's time for you to sleep when you're on the flight, I would try to sleep as much as possible. I would try to replicate being 
home still mm. while on the flight, at least to maintain that circadian rhythm a little bit longer until you get to your destination and then you can work on resetting. But if, if I'm flying out at, let's say, uh, noontime here and I'm still on the flight eight hours later, I'm going to try and take a nap if it's a really, really long flight because I'm going to try and replicate still being at home. Yes, and uh, you did mention a little bit about food and the inflammatory food. So I want to talk a little bit about airline food as well. And of course, there are choices. Sometimes you can pick, but I think, again, it may have to do with first class versus economy. But let's talk a little bit about two aspects. So the first is... Uh, if somebody were a frequent flyer moving through time zones and experiencing jet lag on a regular basis, uh, what would it help to have their overall diet look like and not just while traveling? And the second, of course, is what are the ways that you could probably help yourself with some level of choices while eating on flights themselves? Yes. So the best way to minimize the, the problems with flying and jet lag and inflammation is to just have a proper healthy diet. Generally have a good healthy lifestyle, uh, not too much carbs, not too much gluten, uh, good healthy fats, lots of vegetables, healthy meats that this is my approach. Uh, that's one way. Uh, the other way is, uh, adopting an intermittent fasting or a fasting protocol. Uh, when you know that their choices aren't going to be good, I would just avoid eating altogether, uh, right. which is what I do most of the time now on these flights anyways. Yeah, that's a great approach for sure, considering that airline food is uh, usually pretty high in gluten and dairy and you'll get sandwiches mm -hmm. and pastas. Uh, but one more aspect is that we spoke about sleeping versus non-sleeping on a flight, but typically most people end up exposing themselves to EMF and screens. And uh, so how does EMF exposure uh, impact uh, the severity of jet lag, especially when it's very long flights? And yeah. what can one do to, um, what are the, some of the hacks that people could use to actually mitigate the effect of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, EMFs, I, I think it's hard to quantify the total exposure. Obviously, if you are flying, the longer you're flying and the longer you're in the sky, the more exposure you're getting. Uh, they said a flight from like Los Angeles to New York is equivalent to two chest x-rays or eight uh, dental x-rays uh, if you're at the dentist's office. So there, there is exposure. Uh, one of the ways to mitigate that, obviously, you still have to go on the flight, but uh, these days there's some nice technologies. One of the things that I use is uh, EMF shielding clothing. So mm. there's particular clothing that has silver lining that helps block EMFs from penetrating through your body. Uh, and I have links on that on my website. I can share with you later. Yes. Uh, and uh, another is uh, grounding, which you can't do while you're in the plane, but one of the ways when we fly again, back to the inflammatory process, we're also accumulating positive charge. Uh, this is through exposure, our day-to-day -day life. We, we accumulate this. And one of the big recommendations I, I say, and I do when I land is uh, what's called grounding or earthing, which is basically reconnecting to the earth. Uh, the earth carries more of a negative charge and actually will pull that positive charge out of you. So an easy way to do that would be once you land is find a park or some grass or a, a, a pool or a body of water or a beach, uh, anywhere where you can kind of reconnect to the earth will help mm -hmm. reset the body, reduce the inflammation, reduce the positive charge, uh, reduce the EMF exposure. So doing Shavasana on the floor would be great. Yes, on the <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm a big fan. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, let I know that you have several tools on your website, but I do want you to explain a little bit about, I know people have some level of confusion regarding what are actually amber glasses, blue light blockers, red glasses. So can you just differentiate a little bit about that? And how does, yeah. how do those different aspects, is it that 
they are required at different times of the day, different levels of light exposure. So when do we need which one? One of the biggest controllers of our sleep and our function is light exposure uh, through different wavelengths. When we wake up in the morning, we want to get sun exposure on the face. You know, it's a full spectrum light, blue light, all of this. This is what we need to wake up, get energized, stop melatonin release, You know, have some cortisol release. This is one aspect of it. When it comes to evening time, we want to flip that upside down. Uh, when we're on a flight or if we're through, going through airports um, and we can control, we can't control our lighting like we can in our house. We have to control it with tools or objects. You know, for me, uh, it's blue light blocking glasses, which is what I'm wearing right now. It's nighttime here. It's, you know, I have red lights at home, but there's different shades and colors of glasses. I actually did a post today on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, there's three colors that are available. Uh, you'll see a lot of blue light blocking glasses in a clear color online, which I don't recommend. They, they claim it, it's doing something, but it actually has to be a color or a tint to block out those wavelengths. Uh, generally, the yellow color is going to be more for daytime uh, exposure. Yes, there you go. Yes, mm. perfect. I have the same ones right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <There you> <laughs> yeah. So I use the yellow ones when I'm sitting in front of a computer uh, or if I'm in a room where there's not a lot of windows and I'm under a lot of like fluorescent lighting. You, uh, which is great uh, during the day. If you're flying to the airport, you can use that or on the flight. Uh, when it comes more towards evening, I, I get switch over to the orange colors. Mm. And this helps block a little bit more of that blue and green spectrum. Uh, but yet yeah, still allows you to see. And then there's a red one, which I have, but not on me right now. But uh, that one blocks out all color of light except for red. And when you wear those, it's the same as if you were... In a, in a dark cave. And basically it's tricking your brain into thinking it's nighttime, you, you need to go to sleep, time to release melatonin. So if I wear those, uh, I'll generally start to get sleepy within about 30 minutes. So uh, I don't wear them too often just because I'm at home, but, and they're difficult to navigate. If you're wearing them and walking around, you, you can hit things because they're very strong. Uh, you're not going to see much, but on a flight uh, with a baseball cap or a hoodie and those red glasses, that's going to set you up for the best sleep with the the least uh, junk light exposure. Mm. Yeah. So, so then do, does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does make sense. And I'm just assuming that you also want to clarify that if you're on a flight and you're using this and it is your nighttime biologically, then you want to try and, uh, get yourself sleeping with all these different tools. Uh, but you did differentiate it very well because I do see a lot of confusion between. And the other thing that you notice, which I feel also could contribute, and I want to get your thoughts on that, is uh, wearing regular sunglasses, which have a dark tint right through the day. Um, you see a lot of people who are outside even having lunch with friends and they're shutting off their eyes of uh, natural light exposure with these very dark tinted sunglasses because uh, it looks nice. And what are your thoughts on blocking away the daylight itself? I know we are taking a little segue off of jet lag, but I do want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question as well, too. Uh, I live here in Los Angeles, near Santa Monica and the beach, and I spend a lot of time by the ocean. And a lot of people, when you go to the beach, you'll see they're are wearing sunglasses, traditional, regular sunglasses. And when you look at them and you think, okay, this makes sense because it's sunny and they want protection, you know, UV and this and that. But when you look closer at them or over a larger population, you'll see that these are the people that are having more sunburn. And more issues because when you have sunglasses on, you're blocking spectrums of light during the day that would enable your brain to uh, release what's called melanin. And melanin is the, the the darker pigment in our skin that helps. It's our own body's natural protection uh, sunblock. Mm. So sun protection. So uh, actually, if you're wearing sunglasses, I would say it's probably 
not the best idea. I try to avoid wearing sunglasses for the majority of the time. If I'm in a really sunny place for a long time, maybe, but if that, I'll even wear a baseball cap. Uh, if you need, if you need to get reduced sun glare, uh, but generally I don't wear sunglasses because I want the sun to hit my face and during the day and hit the eye, you know, at least indirectly hit my eyes and tell my body that it's, it's still daytime. I still need to be awake and I still need to uh, continue to produce uh, the hormones and the, the, the bodily biological functions so I can be healthy. Mm. I do want have a little bit of time to talk about jet lag itself because it's a major stress on the body. And um, being a sleep biohacker, I'd like to know all about some of those hacks, using supplements, so foods. What are all the ways that somebody can actually offset this, this major stress that happens from jet lag? Yeah. So there's some ways that we can uh, mitigate the stress from jet lag. And it doesn't just have to be jet lag because it could be, you know, we're having a rough day or we're just having difficulty sleeping from life stress. I mean, stress is stress, whether it's from flying or from problems that we have day or to even day in working, life. Or even working different Work, time zones. Yes. Working different time zones, family, friends, kids. I mean, stress can come <laughs> from anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so as we stress, we want to find ways to reduce that stress. One of the easiest ways, and I don't know if I put it in my guide or not, but is but like you mentioned, Shavasana is, is meditation or yoga is just basically giving the time, the mind time to relax, to stop thinking about all of the different things. So if you're on a flight and you notice that you're just not feeling as calm or as centered as possible, you can do some breathing exercises, you know, mm. you can do some slow meditative breathing, what's called box breathing. I don't know if you've heard, have you heard of that before? No. So box breathing, here's a quick method you can practice and anyone listening can try it. Uh, imagine a box or a square, four sides. And the way it works is you take an inhale for four seconds. So you go inhale, one, two, three, four. You hold for four seconds, one, two, three, four. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four. And then you repeat the cycle. So four seconds around the square. Uh, do that four or five times and you'll find that you become much more calm, peaceful, relaxed, centered. Uh, it's something that I use all the time. It's something that they train uh, military to do when they're in stressful situations. So it's a very centering, grounding uh, breath exercise. Uh, but on top of that, if you want to take some more fun and different supplements. Uh, there's things called molecular hydrogen, uh, which is a very uh, powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. It's basically hydrogen gas that's in these little pills. Uh, they look like little black pills. You put them in a cup of water, the water fizzes up, and then you just drink it. It's very simple, very easy, easy to fly with, easy to use. Um, that helps reduce the inflammation. It boosts mitochondria, it repairs DNA. Uh, there's another thing called glutathione, which mm. is the body's man master antioxidant. Very I, popular I now. Love, people. I love glutathione. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, there, and there's different ways to get it. Uh, it's a little bit more unstable when we have it in liquid form. It ships on ice. A lot of people get it via IV. Uh, and then there's pill forms as well, too. So that's something that I take whenever I feel like uh, I'm getting more toxic. <laughs> so it's more of a detoxing type uh, supplement. Right. One of the biggest things that I use and I recommend for jet lag, specifically for jet lag hacking, is melatonin. Mm -hmm. uh, and melatonin, a lot of people use it on a nightly basis. I tend not to, but it is the best for resetting your circadian clock. So let's say you arrive at your destination. If it's daytime, don't take it. If it's nighttime, you need to go to sleep. That's the time to take it. Probably a little bit bigger dose is what I recommend. And then try and go to sleep. Yeah. What would you say would be a bigger dose? And I've spoken so much about melatonin in different ways on different episodes. And uh, there are people who said that you shouldn't take more than one gram. There are people who say go up to six grams. Um, so uh, I think milligrams, right? Milligram, milligrams, yeah. I correct. Yeah. So here's a reference for you. When we go to sleep at night, our brains release melatonin in the pineal gland or the third eye or where, whatever you want to call it. I'm a big fan of chakras and, and, and Eastern and Indian and all of these different uh, 
philosophies. So one interesting thing about the pineal gland is it's one of the few, it's one of only two structures in the brain that is not covered with the blood brain barrier, which means when it secretes hormones, it can actually go directly into the bloodstream, mm. which is fascinating. So the important part is that when you release melatonin at night, the healthy amount that your body releases is 0.3 milligrams. Mm. That's it. Not even one milligram, a third of a milligram. So we have to wonder, you know, how much is the, is the human taking that's going to work for them? Now, uh, everybody's different. Some people need a lot because they're just the way their biology works. Some people are very sensitive and need a little bit. I usually, if I'm going to take it, uh, on a normal night, maybe one milligram is what I would take. If I'm traveling, I'll take three or four milligrams. And, and I take it with a liquid, a sublingual liquid spray. Mm -hmm. So I get faster absorption under the tongue. Obviously, if you're taking it through pill and through your stomach, it might be different. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out how your body works. If you used it before, what form you're taking, how badly do you need to go to sleep? One other thing to remember is melatonin has a half-life of 45 minutes, mm. which means in 45 minutes, half of it's already gone out of your system. So taking melatonin to think it's going to keep you asleep the whole night is not practical because it's going to be out of your system shortly. It's a great sleep initiator. It'll help you get to sleep, I think, but it won't you know, lock you down for the whole night as well too. So you have to be aware of that as well. That's a great point because I've never heard that differentiation and you see a lot of people taking these high doses of melatonin and they say it works amazing, but then they do talk about waking up every few hours and not being able to sustain sleep. So this is actually the first time I've heard that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, I know we spoke about supplements, but is there any specific um, food or uh, form of hydration on flights that could help uh, the, do this similar role of what we just spoke about in terms of supplementation? Any juices? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one, one thing that I've done more often now is taking uh, like a mineral water versus just still water. I, I think the gas in there is, is helpful just for, for better oxygenation. Uh, that's been something I do. Uh, juices, I try not to do too much just because of the high sugar content. Uh, mm. Try to stay away from all of the high carb, starchy, gluten type foods. Sometimes you can order, I don't know, halal or kosher. Sometimes the, the food might be different or better. I haven't you know, looked into it that much, but there are options or vegetarian. You might have a better chance at some, some proper food. Uh, again, I, I don't do too much food these days on these flights just because uh, I'd rather fast and, and keep my body uh, focusing on staying healthy versus trying to digest uh, food that's going to make it worse. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I would be in agreement with you. And I also know a lot of people who say, but how can I, when I'm on the flight, that food is just calling to yes. me to eat it. Yes, it's boring. <laughs> I mean, you're sitting on a, you're sitting on a plane for hours and hours. Yes, food is, it, it helps us occupy time. You know, yes, it's tempting. You see somebody next to you eating some nice sandwich and meal and, and, you have to be able to manage that. Yes, I know. I know the, the, the pain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what would be the sleep biohackers hacks for somebody who has a life of frequent flying? So mm -hmm. how would you suggest that they plan? Uh, let's say they're moving three time zones every week. So how do they plan their uh, schedule overall uh, beyond flying as well? And uh, also in terms of, of course, you spoke a little bit about healthy diet, but is there any specific plate, something that you would, you could just talk us through what would be on your plate if your life were like that? Like actual food on my plate or a, yes. a, a, actual, a, a lifestyle? Ac actual food on your plate. Okay. So for me, I'm a fan of uh, this thing called Bulletproof Coffee or this like fatty coffee. Yeah. Uh, I, I would do that. Like, let's say if I'm, we'll give you an example. If I'm flying from here to New York, that's three time zones. Uh, I would plan it where in the morning I would make a, a bullet. I would try to catch a morning flight. Uh, let's say 8 a.m. from LA. Uh, it's about a four hour flight to New York. So uh, I would get there 
at noon and then it would be a three hour time shift. It would be, so it would be three hours after I get there about 3 PM, something like that. And I think it would be a very easy one for me at that in that case, because, and I wouldn't eat anything. I would have my coffee. The cop, what the coffee does is the, the coffee with the butter and the, what's called MCT oil or coconut oil, uh, boosts ketones mm. and ketones are also anti-inflammatory. It's a fantastic fuel source for your brain and it's uh, anti-inflammatory and your body will stay satiated. It will stay full. So that would help me kind of resist the temptations and the urges to eat all of the junk food in the airports and on the flight. I would land in New York. It would be about three o'clock. I would go about finishing whatever the rest of my day I need to do. And that, that night I would take some melatonin and that would be easy. The tricky part is if I'm going to do a flight that would be like later in the day or overnight, then you have to worry about the red light glasses, the light mitigation, uh, the, the food you don't obviously want to be eating when your circadian rhythm of your gut and your stomach and your intestines is asleep. Because yeah. then that would that cause what's called a circadian mismatch. And you're, you're giving your, it's like if I started eating a dinner at three in the morning uh, in my bed, it's, it's, it's not used to that. That's going to cause, you know, gastric disruption, uh, bloating, gas. Uh, and that's one of the things I also recommend when you're flying is to uh, have fiber, uh, yeah. wh whether it's a powder or a tablet or, or hot foods high in fiber, because you want to make sure that your gut is going to be able to keep moving once, once you land. Cause that's one of the other big problems when people travel is the, the gut kind of shuts down for a while. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of timing the flight, uh, timing the food intake, timing the light exposure, the supplements, uh, the, the grounding. Oh my God. It's all, you know, but if you're someone who travels uh, regularly, this becomes automatic because you know, okay, I'm going to this destination. I've done it before. This is what I need to do before. This is what I need to do afterwards. And it gets easier and easier. And you did mention bulletproof coffee and you said it can prevent you having these temptations on the flat. I want to say two things about that. I think one is it's so important that people do um, have some sort of blood sugar balance with their meals before they get on these flights to avoid seeking these sugary foods and high carb foods. Uh, but I wanted to get your thoughts on what would you feel if given that there are so many people out there today who have challenges with their liver and uh, gallbladder function. I see a lot of clients myself who show up with these challenges and they're not actually able to tolerate high levels of fat. So do you recommend supporting their liver health with something while they make these shifts in their diet? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, you want to obviously be aware of how your body works. Uh, one of the things I also uh, mentioned in other podcasts and other conversations is people who have some of these digestive issues, they can look at taking digestive enzymes. Mm. Uh, there are certain supplements that help you know, break down the fats and the carbs and the proteins. I took some tonight with dinner mm. uh, just because I, I want to have give my body the optimal chance. So uh, and there's a thing called ox bile uh, that yes. people can use when they have, um, if they've had the gallbladder taken out or they, if they have trouble processing fats. So this is another thing that you can do uh, if you have uh, a digestive system that's not optimal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because there is, I know that I recently came across a lot of people who tried a ketogenic diet advised by friends, and then they had severe challenges with their mm. digestive health, and uh, they were uh, not yet optimized to be able to digest that level. And it's getting more and more frequent that I see these kind of people, which is why I wanted to. But mm. great, great information that, you, and I know you also have, a brochure on your uh, site so people yeah. could uh, get that if they want to just get all this information in one yes group. yes I, yeah i do have uh, a guide and uh, yeah they can go to my website sleepbiohacker.com and they can download that uh, guide and uh, it goes over all this information but yeah you bring up a good point about people having difficulty with this ketogenic diet 
for me, it, it was a little bit rough. It was a couple of years ago when I started doing it. And uh, I'm Persian, Iranian and, and Indian. They have very similar diets with a lot of rice, with a lot of bread. Uh, and that was a big shift to kind of pull away from that for me because I was fighting my genetics a little bit. <laughs> but uh, over time, I think it was a combination of uh, slowly adapting um, diet, uh, intermittent fasting or, or, or full fasting, uh, that also helps boost ketones, you know, nutritional ketosis. Uh, so it's, it's a process for some people. It's very easy for some people. It takes a little bit of practice, but now I got to a point where I can get into ketosis within 24 to 36 hours with high ketone levels. And I can be there for a while. And then I can go and have, you know, some, some carbs later, get out of ketosis without any real repercussions and then get back into it again. And that's metabolic flexibility. Yes. Which, which is great because I could eat what I want when I want without having severe consequences. I think that's very important because I'm also a big fan of being metabolically flexible. And I think it's very important to be able to do that and keep moving through different. But it was interesting that you spoke about going against your genetics because there's so much emphasis placed today uh, on eating local foods, being very true to what your culture is. And um, I personally, I'd let people know that it's okay to do things a little differently um, away from what they're used to, away from their culture, provided that it's going to help them and benefit and give them positive health changes. So uh, that is a battle though, because a lot of people do speak, especially in India about eating very, very local. And like you said about your culture, Indian culture is also very highly rice-based. Uh, and then you see people yes. having these blood sugar crashes all the time and mood fluctuations, headaches and low energy. Um, so very valid. Yeah, there's point. a big cultural component to it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, if if I go to to see my mom, the first thing she's going to say is, you know, sit down, let's eat something. Or and if I tell her, no, I'm fasting right now. This is not part of my window to eat. She looks at me and she says, "What? You're not eating. You're you're going to die." Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. So so there has to be some balance between culture and science. Yes, I agree totally. And in fact, even when you advise um, people that you work with, the first reaction they get to recommendation of fasting a whole day is, but how can I last a whole day? I can't. I need my body needs food. I'll be so tired. I can't. In fact, your energy shoots up after those long fasts and you feel so yes. profoundly. And But great takeaways, Dr. J, and I want to respect your time. So I just want you to um, share a few things. The last thing is that there's so many people struggling with sleep issues today all over the world. In your mind, what do you think is the biggest reason for this? I think there is, there's a big reason right now that's specific to this whole pandemic and this whole culture of fear that uh, that's being pushed into everybody's lives. Um, that's added an extra layer of stress for everybody, mm. which has made it difficult. People already had problems sleeping. Uh, this, the media, the news, uh, the constant scares, uh, it's, it's a lot for people to take in the social isolation, you know, the social distancing. Um, that's been the biggest problem, I think, for, for everybody these days. Uh, on top of that, there is obviously other things like the blue light exposure, uh, people being on their phones late at night, watching TV. Uh, the problem with the, the blue light and the phone specifically, too, is that uh, not only is the light hitting your face and, and causing the melatonin to not be released, but it's also the content. You know, when you're going through these sites, you're getting what's called a, a dopamine hit. And mm. basically, uh, it's an addiction uh, where you are just absorbing information almost mindlessly. And next thing you know, an hour, two hours have gone by and uh, you didn't get anything out of it other than this this dopamine hit and, and you've messed up your sleep. So... Uh, 
it's a lot of lifestyle things and it's also the the whole situation of the world right now which is really taking a toll on on everybody's sleep and we have a mantra on our show so i'd like you to complete it for us as well which is if sleep is the new medicine then how would you complete the sentence for us if sleep is the new medicine then you should be taking more of it every day thank you dr <laughs> j for giving your time and having this conversation with me and i will also link your podcast to the episode so people can go take a listen to your podcast and uh, it was great having you lots of information and your room looks so nice when it's transformed <laughs> into this pink zone <laughs> Uh, yes <laughs> thank you yeah it's my red bulbs this is what i do at night and people think i joke but i i actually have red lights throughout my house i actually have another light on just because we're recording but it would be more like uh, this and mm -hmm. uh when i have these lights on i could still see what i'm doing but i'm also uh protecting my brain and my eyes so i can start getting ready for bed so and yeah this is so important even when uh, i have calls late in the night and uh, i would find that if, before i started some of these hacks i would find that every time i had calls i would lose sleep i would keep waking up and these are simple things that everybody can do to help themselves sleep so much better so great conversation and it was a mm -hmm. pleasure having you today Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show. Just a reminder that this podcast is for information purposes only. This is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or otherwise qualified health professional. This information is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you are looking for personal help on your health journey, do seek out a medical practitioner. Please do make your own healthcare decisions based upon your research and in partnership with your doctor or otherwise qualified healthcare professional. It is in no way intended as medical advice as a substitute for medical counseling or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. Be sure to always work directly with a qualified health practitioner before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle. that may feel out of your realm of comfort or understanding if you are looking for an allied functional medicine practitioner do seek out more information on www.phytothrive.com or www.sleepwhisperer.pro it is important that you have someone who is qualified and understands your health personally in order to provide adequate care especially when it comes to chronic health conditions Conditions.